Jay here for Stretford Paddock. This is the Tier 1 podcast. Joining me is Joe Smith, not Ronaldo Brown, but always, always good to have a change. How you doing? Yeah, I'm all right. Not much to talk about, though, is there? No, it's just, it's just, it's just one of those boring weeks, isn't it, where nothing happens. <laughs> just same old, same old. Quiet day at Manchester United. Yeah. Um, also, we've got a special guest. Henry Winter joins us again from The Times. Henry, thanks for coming on the channel again. Hi, guys. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. It's all a bit quiet, and it's not really a lot to discuss, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll try our best. Um... I've just been reading your your recent article on Manchester United. And I think you use terms like um, shambolic and dithered when you're talking about United and how it's being run. Um, just sum up why you think the club keeps getting things wrong and why it is just you know just such a mess, really. Because there's a disconnect between the owners and the club. There's a. I mean, when I go to Manchester United, there is a football club in there, but I'm almost sort of fighting my way through the, the commercial side. To get that. Look, this is nothing new. This goes back sort of 20 years. This predates the Glazers. But I just think that if you ha do have distant owners, and this is not simply a Manchester United issue, Liverpool have had it, although they've, they've put a better structure in place. Arsenal have certainly had it with Cronky, although they put a better structure in place now. And Josh Cronker, Stan Sun, is being more visible. But the problem with the Glazers, they're holed up in the Everglades. They're taking the, the, the money out, your money, not theirs, by the way, in their dividends. And the whole thing has just become a financial transaction for them rather than a sort of footballing or an emotional engagement. And I think when you have that distance, you don't have the immediacy of reaction. My local club to here, much smaller club, um, Leicester City, but they have an owner um, in top, obviously, tragically, his father passed away, but he's they're far more immediate. When decisions need to be made, there's a far quicker uh, structure. Chelsea, Abramovich is obviously in different parts of the world, but with Marina Granovskaya, they've got someone who is basically his voice within the club, who is within the building. I think when you've got that, that distance between Florida and Old Trafford, you've got issues, regardless of how well connected and how often he communicates with, uh, uh, that Ed Woodward communicates with, with Florida. You've got that disconnect there. I think the, if you have owners, they should actually be far more, A, visible. I know they'll get sick if they turn up. But they, A, they should be far more visible, talking to you guys, coming on um, programmes like this, and also turning up in matches and feeling the mood of what, the Manchester United away fans are thinking, the Manchester United home fans are thinking, not simply just ignoring social media. Just, you know, so there is that sort of huge disconnect there. And I think Manchester, simple in headline terms, Manchester United has got to remember it's a football club first and a commercial operation second. No, I agree. I agree with all of that. And, you know, it just does seem to be so this never-ending cycle that we're in of, of, you know, one manager coming in and nothing really changing. Um, at the minute, <laughs> or for now, it's it's Michael Carrick who's uh, who's in in the hot seat. You you know him quite well. You know you co-wrote his autobiography. What do you think he's going to bring to the role, even if it is only for a, a few matches? Well, I wish he was ten years younger and playing in central midfield because I well. think it would it would solve some of your problems in terms of shielding a shaky back line. He would also ping the ball out, you know, because of the way he can play the ball to to, to release all that talent, you know, underperforming talent you've got out wide. I think what he will bring is a bit more balance to the team. I think there'll be a bit more front foot. I think because because if you if you look at the the the, the coaches that Carrick played on during his career, the individuals like Martin Yol at Spurs, who he found very uplifting because of his tactics, because of his man management. Obviously, Sir Alex, who he, he still calls, you know, the boss. Uh, the inspiration that he found, he took from him, um, and then learning partly through their mistakes of David Moyes, who kind of froze, you know, in 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 the position and thought he was still at Everton rather than a far bigger club in Manchester United. And then Van Gaal, who was just too much into detail, it was relentless detail, and even the little things like sending emails to players and then putting little trackers on him just to see whether the players had actually looked at the emails and were going through the clips that he'd sent them about the performance. And I think Carrick probably, I'm talking from my own sort of perspective of it, he probably took from that that man management of players is as important as the sort of, you know, the forensic uh, detail. Ditto with Jose Mourinho when he came in. So I think Carrick's 
obvious strength through his people skills. I mean, you've met him. He's a very, he's quite shy. He, he does, he's not particularly wanting headlines or whatever. He just wants to play. He wants the team to be the star. It's the way he played. It's the way he lives his life. But I think, I know when he, when Moyes left, Carrick looked at himself in the mirror and, and, and went, what have I done wrong here? Should I have done more? Did I miss that tackle in that game? Should I have played that pass in that game? I think I think it bring accountability. There's one thing I was going to say about Carrick. I think the way he is, you know, going into to training as a coach, just as he did as a player, wanting to give everything in training, in a match, playing for the shirt, the pride. You know, he's always wanted to manage Manchester United. He's got this brief window now, however long it is, one, two, three games before they get an interim. And actually, when we talk about shambles, you've actually got a caretaker, caretaker. You know, <laughs> this is Manchester United, the biggest <laughs> club in the world, not short of a bob or two. There should be succession planning. They should have more things in place to say, right, we'll get someone in. So look, that's, but that's by the by, that's not Carrick. Mm. Carrick, it was interesting when... Um, Manchester United had their player of the year. I think it was in 2018 and everyone knew that Michael was going to stand down. And there was a, at, at the do, there was, you know, the, the, the lights dimmed and the video came on and, and players and people in, you know, important people in Carrick's life did these little sort of video tributes. To them. And one of them was from Wayne Rooney. And it said, Michael brings a calming influence to the team. And I think that's probably what Manchester United need now. They need someone to go into the dressing room to, to, to have a word with Harry Maguire. Harry Maguire, we saw in the summer, I mean, I covered all England's games in the summer at the Euros. Harry Maguire was voted in the team of the tournament, despite having a slow start because he was coming back from injury. There was a good defender in Harry Maguire. I understand the criticism of him and I bumped into him at St George's Park in the recent uh, in, in, international break. And he's obviously very hurt by this, but he needs to realise he's captain of Manchester United. That is a huge honour. And he has to he has to be accountable. He's got to raise his game. And I think because of Carrick's people skills, his quiet advice, he will actually, you know, he will bring that from him. Carrick's very, very popular, A, because of what he's like as a player, B, because of what he's like as a person, but also because of what he's like as a, as a coach. Now, obviously, Manchester United look, from my layman's eye, too undercoached at the moment. They need to be more drilled in defensive organisation and that. So Carrick's got to show that he, he can do that. But, you know, I've spoken to players that he's worked one-on-one -on -one with and he said, listen, they've, 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 he's really improved, you know, in you know, parts of my game. You know, when he would sit down with Paul Pogba, this was two, three years ago, sit down with Paul Pogba and really, and go through clips with him and just said, listen, you are such a good player. You know, this was before the World Cup. He said, you can go on and do whatever you like in the world because you are so good. So I think in a very quiet, non-hairdryer way, mm. um, he, will, he will be a player whisperer. I think he will help players. But you know what? Ultimately, whatever we do in our jobs, your jobs, my jobs, we're responsible for our performances. And Manchester United players mm. have let the shirt down. They've got to play with more pride. They've got to play with more professionalism. They are well paid. You know, when they go on the pitch, they shouldn't be thinking about their paychecks. They should be thinking about the victory and, the, and representing Manchester United. The incredible support that you guys have given the team and also, until obviously towards the end of Vicarage Road, have, have, have given Oli Gunnar Solskjaer. And I think that it's about time the players paid you guys back mm. for that support. Because I tell you what, other clubs would have turned earlier. No, yeah, I completely understand that. I completely agree. Um, in terms of the differences between Michael Carrick and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, what, what do you think the main difference is in their terms, sort of their approach to, to coaching? I think you, you have to understand to be Manchester United manager is is not just simply about turning up at Carrington, having a coffee, getting the coaches together, and then going down to training for two hours. The the, the, the I wouldn't call it pressures, but the the actual workload that a Manchester United manager has is is absolutely crazy. I was talking to I spoke to Jose about it once, and he was saying like after a game, he has that's right. We were talking about the sort of the English tradition of going for a drink with the opposing manager. And he said, well, it's actually quite difficult when you're Manchester United manager, because for an hour afterwards, you've got to go and do 
all different forms of media and particularly overseas broadcasters now with all these lucrative um, overseas television deals. You've got to do that. You've got to go into the sponsors lounge, you've got to be, pop into the boardroom as well. So being Manchester United manager, you know, you're not a head coach. You have to do all these things. You're almost a general manager in a way. And I think that's where Manchester United have got to move away f- from that. Solskjaer should have, I know he he did delegate and he had trust in, in McKenna and Carrick to go and take the training sessions. But actually, I think nothing beats having the manager mm. actually feet on the ground, boots on the ground, at Carrington, on the training pitch, keeping an eye on players, looking at the body mood of a Mason Greenwood. How can I get him better? He should be England centre forward with, with Harry Kane. He should be going to the World Cup. What is it about Mason Greenwood at the moment? What is it about Harry Maguire's position that he can get caught out of position? Why is it that Lindelof seemed to be more worried about not giving away a, a handball penalty when uh, Watford are attacking than actually preventing preventing a goal? What is it about Aaron Wan-Bissaka? Do I need to sort of talk to... All these little things that sort of players, just tweaking players' games, uh, working with their personalities, lif- lifting their spirits. A manager really needs to be on a training ground there. I think that's something that Manchester United have got to juggle, whether Darren Fletcher does more or John McDermott um, does more of the um, of the training side, sorry, of, the, uh, of that sort of, sort of the general manager side. I think that has to be, you know, as, as addressed. But I hope Michael just gets out on the training ground and works. Yeah, you, you mentioned before about how the players have almost, and this this tends to happen at every club, I think, when a manager is on the brink of being sacked, the players stop being criticised almost. And, and it's almost the bad performances are used to turn the, the mirror t- toward the manager and say, look how bad your players are playing. But some of the, 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 the performances we've seen from the players are, borderline pathetic aren't they at times where you just think you're not 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 only are you not playing for the manager but you you aren't playing for the shirt you aren't playing for the fans and I think you know there need to there needs to be like you said a little bit more sort of ownership of of, of those performances but short term obviously Carrick is very short term and then we've got this slightly longer short term as you mentioned the fast behind that already um with the interim coming in but do you think Carrick can turn that around because We've got half a dozen or so players in the squad at the minute. You've mentioned a couple of them already, who are not just underperforming, but look like you know barely performing. Can Carrick turn that around quickly? Because this game tomorrow is a, is a huge game uh, that we've got coming up in terms of the future of the Champions League. I think it can be an interesting, interesting statement of intent when you see Carrick's first team sheet, mm. whether Donny van der Beek is is in. And I know. I can understand the appreciation of him. I'm, a, I'm an admirer of him for, for you know, for, for what he's done in previous clubs and also for, for the Dutch national team. There's a fantastic player in there. But I also think he brings, I know he maybe his, uh, his, maybe his best position is more sort of almost like a sort of number 10. You've got Bruno Fernandes, who himself, he's got to look at his own game at the moment because he's not, mm. he's not been playing well, certainly by the standards of his first two years at United. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see that first team share. I'd like to see Donny van der Beek given a start. I just think that would set a tone. You've got a player there who is desperate to play, who sounds from everything that you hear about Donny van der Beek, is a, is a consummate professional. You haven't heard a squeak of protest about him. He's, he's gone about his, uh, you know, his work at training. I would love to see him start just to break up the sort of the whole sort of McFred mm. uh, issue in the, in, in the centre. Um I mean, McTominay, I'm a big fan of McTominay. I mean, I saw him during the, the Euros and there is a there is a good player there. But And this is, I have to say, it's an indictment of Solskjaer, is that players haven't trained on under Solskjaer. You know, you, you, you look at the top managers, you look at what Tuchel's done with, with Chelsea and he's made good players better. He's organised them. OK, so he's brought Lukaku in, but actually they've played without Lukaku recently and they've been terrific just because you've got a very good coach there, a good man manager there. And... I think Carrick will work like that, but I think Donny van der Beek. He's, he's give, give, give him the chance because I think Manchester United two defensive pivots. That for me isn't the Manchester United way. It's almost become a sort of a, a political and, and symbolic thing at this point as well, hasn't it? McFred in there, like you know, when, when they're playing, it's a sign that we're playing defensive. We're not, you know, coming out of our shell. We're trying to just lock things down and hope for the best. So yeah, I think we, we might see a bit more of that moving forward. Then looking at maybe the interim or the the one before the next. I don't know how it's going to work. Like you said, there's a, a bit of a shambles going on there. But looking forward then after Michael Carrick, because obviously he's supposedly a very sort of short term option. 
Pochettino spoken, uh, you've spoken to him recently. He's someone that's been spoken about uh, across the media today, especially um, links with him uh, joining Manchester United. Do you think he is United's main target? Do you think he was someone that would suit the job? And, and you know, sort of almost more importantly, do you think he's someone we could get? Because he's at PSG, arguably one of the biggest jobs in management these days. And yet there seems to be talk of unrest and he's, he doesn't like the amount of power he has there. There's always, you know, a sort of an in and out swinging door of, of managers at PSG as well. Is Poch the guy, do you think? In next summer, I would be surprised if he moved now. Look, anything's possible in, yeah. in football. Um, Manchester City might do you a favour if they gave, him a, gave uh, PSG a whacking on uh, on Wednesday. I look, I mean, he's working with Lionel Messi, who's probably the top three footballers of all time. He's got Neymar, he's got Kylian Mbappe. He's got, you know, he's playing fantasy football there. As a coach, does he necessarily want to walk a, a, away from that? He's got owners who will sort of back him. He's got obviously Leonardo, the sporting director as well. He's got, you know, and maybe there are one or two sort of issues there. But you know what, Pochettino has never been a, a manager who sort of demanded loads and loads of players. He quite likes working with a group, but he is a, he is a long-term process, man. He, li he likes to develop teams. You saw it with Tottenham. I mean, we're coming back to... Did he make players better? And it's and he does. And it's very interesting when you talk to Pochettino. He doesn't. See, you can ask him about something to do with him. He said, "Are you living in a hotel in Paris?" Which he still is. Ten months after, which is you know probably encouraging from Manchester United's perspective. But he, but he always talks about we. Every answer back is is a we. And I thought this is all a bit royal. But actually, it's it's nothing to do with that. It's because he, he's got you know he's three close coaches and they're very much a group. It's very much a he talks you know if he gets an award he, he immediately shares it around with the, with the his other coaches, and they work so well on the training ground. And they've all got slightly complementary characters. In fact, one of them is number two. I helped do his media training at the Pro Licence at St George's Park. And he's such an engaging individual. Now, OK, so having a coffee with a journalist is no indicator that you can actually man manage Messi. Mm. But it's still, they are very engaging characters, good tactically. You can see an identity. I, I could describe what a Pochettino team is. I certainly couldn't with a, with a Solskjaer team i think you've lost your identity and i think you might need someone who who can bring your identity back but i think also it has to be a, an identity that chimes with manchester united's traditions and i think pochettino would do that in terms of his commitment to the homegrown in terms of his commitment to attack i also think and I, I don't know eric ten Hag particularly well but just talking to people in holland mm. i think he would do that as well but you know you talk about Eric Ten Hag, you could do with Edwin van der Sar coming back as well, just in terms of having that more football expertise in the uh, in the club. But yeah, look, Pochettino is he's a very engaging character. He'll get the media on side. But you know, with respect, I'm sure Jose Mourinho would say this. What's Pochettino won yet? You know, I think he's he does. Okay, so he's had one trophy in in um, in France, and he'll he's like he's what ten points clear in Ligue 1 at the moment, so he's likely to win that as PSG should do, but. I think he possibly would come because PSG is quite a political club. I mean, won't, I read some of it, or he might move because Manchester United will offer him a lot of money. I don't think PSG's owners are exactly at short of a bubble to. Yeah, that's the one thing they're not lacking, isn't it, in terms of what you can offer a manager. Um, it sounds like you think he would be a good fit at United. I think he like some of the, the style of play stuff. I think the one concern, like you mentioned, would maybe be when things aren't going well, if six months, eight months, a year into the job, we do lose a few games, he can't really fall back and say, look at all these things I've won, trust me, it'll come good, which may be a bit of an issue. Um, Pochi, obviously, we mentioned, you, you briefly mentioned Ten Hag there. We're also linked with, you know, Zidane and Lauren Blanc on a short-term basis and Brendan Rodgers is another one that we keep hearing. Who, uh, the fact that we're linked with so many uh, uh, managers and the fact that, like you mentioned before, we've got this interim leading into the interim leading into the full-time uh, role. Do you think that they, they sort of know what they're doing? Do you think they have a, a number one target at Man United? Or does the fact that maybe if you want to look on the positive side, the fact that we're saying it's going to be an interim to the end of the season suggests we're going to go for one of these slightly less attainable managers. We're not just going for the easiest, most available option. Is there any positive to take from the fact that we're that we're doing it this way? And if there is, you know, who do you think it, it, we are sort of leaning towards? Because from from a fan's perspective, it seems as though it's just a. Do you, do you want to join the cult? Okay, no, fair enough. Do you want to join? Yeah, but not till something like it doesn't seem like they know what they're doing at the moment. I mean, they, they made a mistake after the Liverpool game 
they should have sacked Ole Gunnar Solskjaer there. I mean, I've been a sort of long-term supporter of Solskjaer, partly because I, I think managers should be given a chance, partly because mm. you could see what he was trying to do in terms of changing the atmosphere and the spirit and the mood post-Mourinho. There was some sign of progress, certainly in terms of improving the squad, certainly in terms of the league finishes. Was it 6 3 2 I think a huge miss for him was the Europa League final. I think the, the landscape would have been different and all that. But I just think having watched the Liverpool game, was that the Liverpool game? I just thought that's unforgivable. He should have been sacked that day. Surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, because they are the kings of ditherers. They would say it was loyalty. But Manchester United's board just let slip a golden moment to get Antonio Conte. Because if you're looking at the sort of the elite coaches of Europe, you know, you're, you're talking only about sort of five or six, you know, obviously Klopp, Pep, Tuchel, individuals like that. But you, you put Conte in there because he is a serial winner. Because you look, you saw him yesterday uh, in the Spurs game, the way he turned things around against Leeds at halftime and also that emotional engagement. OK, it might be slightly Machiavellian, it might be slightly for, for show, but actually there's something about Conte that gets the crowd going. I never understood that with, with, with Solskjaer. I know it's not his personality. He's the sort of slightly more sort of dignified Norwegian, but sometimes you do need a few emotional fireworks. On the, uh, on the touch line. Ferguson was the master at it, coming out and whether he's having a go at the linesman, having a go at the fourth official, having a go at his defence, having a go at the opposition manager, whatever, just just to sort of inject some energy. It reminded me of something that Roy Keane said the other day, that sometimes he would just go and plough into an opponent to make himself feel better, <laughs> to get the fans going. And actually, I, I kind of like that mm. because everyone needs a fast starter. And I think Conte is a fast starter. You can see it. So I just thought they 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 missed out on that opportunity. But I think in terms of what you're saying, in terms of longer term targets, mm. it'll be Pochettino and Ten Hag. And I have no inside information, but I just think that is kind of the sort of direction of travel. And I think it will be, but but those two wouldn't come until next year. Yeah, um, we've heard recently that Ed Woodward could de be delaying his departure. Um, what sort of a difference do you think it'll make to the club, to United, when he does leave? Depends whether you get David Gill back. <laughs> mm, yeah. I mean, David Gill leaving at the same time as, as Sir Alex was so damaging to the club. I, I totally understood why he wanted to go. He said that, you know, he'd had a, felt he was so sort of tied up with Sir Alex. But I think if Gill had stayed on and just sort of helped with things, I think maybe the, uh, the post Ferguson era might have been slightly less bumpy. <sighs> I mean, Woodward has many faults and obviously he should have stayed as on the financial side. He's absolutely brilliant at the noodle deals and all that. He's not a bad person. I have to say, I didn't enjoy the fact when one or two Manchester United fans went over and sort of threatened his house. I don't know whether there was anyone in it at the time. I think, you, sh you know, United fans should be above that. It does show the, uh, the emotions that get stirred. Um, by by obviously by football by supporting, but I just I just think for such a huge club, you need someone with more football expertise mm. in that position. I know he's trying to sort of slightly move away from the sort of you know the transfer sides and all that, but but yeah, I, I mean I can't imagine you lot will be having too much of a whip round for his his leaving present, but so, but someone like a Van der Zaar, Mm. And I'm not saying that Edwin would leave. I actually he's doing a brilliant job. And obviously it hasn't got, you know, the sort of the scale of Manchester United, but it's still the same, you know, skills, juggling the commercial and the financial and the footballing, dealing with people, dealing with the image of the, of the club. I just think someone like him, I'm not saying he would even dream of coming back. I just think you need someone like him. You need more football expertise. But look, this is a general issue in football. If I look at the, the Arsenal board, how much football expertise there, when England picked their next manager, if I look at the Football Association board, how much football expertise in there, what we need, and this is we'll going slightly off track here, but what we need is former players, not simply to go into the, the studio, not simply to go into um, coaching, but also to actually do 
uh, general management courses mm. so that they can not their pro license, but so that they can they know how to read a spreadsheet. So they can come into it. We need more Gary Neville's. I know Gary Neville's looks like Marmite to some people, but actually, if you sit down with Gary, he talks so much sense about the game. And you would imagine if a Gary Neville was in the board at Manchester United, they wouldn't be making mistakes. And you can argue he's been too loyal to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, but actually. Your your board needs more football expertise, but that's look that's an issue for all clubs, for most clubs. Yeah, and it's sort of following on from that. Do you, do you think the next manager is is going to be hamstrung in terms of the success that that is possible? Because you know we've spent loads of money. It's not you know obviously the Glazers. Uh, none of us are, are big fans of the Glazers whatsoever, and that's a bit of an understatement. But we have spent a lot of money in the last few years and we still seem maybe not quite as far off as we have done in the past, but, you know, pretty far off a title challenge at the moment. What do you think needs to change? Because, you know, Woodward may go, but it's the Glazers and the board who are picking his replacement. It's not as though he goes and, you know, someone just pops up who we all really like, who's really knowledgeable. They just pick the next one and, you know, presumably the, the cycle starts again. What can change within the current system at United for Manchester United to be more successful? You can spend money, and what Solskjaer spent 400 million, I'm not, I'm not sure how correct that figure is, but actually, and how much of that he wants to spend. But you know what? I mean, I've talked to you guys before, I've talked to Manchester United fans walking into the ground, texts, emails, uh, the great joy of social media exchanging sort of views and opinions and listening to what, what people say. You guys have been saying it for ages. We need a proper defensive midfielder and we need a proper right back. When I say proper right back, someone who can get forward and deliver across someone who is reliable defensively. Bram Basaka can be good one-on-one -on -one defensively, but he can get caught out positioning and his, his delivery into the box isn't good enough yet. When you think of the quality of a Reese James, you could have got Kieran Trippier in the summer. Kieran Trippier, obviously, is from your, I think he's from Berry, it's from your neck of the woods. I'm sure he would have, he would have come back after his success in Spain, uh, winning the league. Um, you know, he's an England international. He's, he's also the type of sort of tough guy. You know, I looked at Manchester United at Watford. Who was actually shouting people out? Who, where, where, where were the Keens? I know it's a slightly soft, we're a softer society, softer generation. People, you know, the the um, the hair draw, the Roy Keane scream at people doesn't necessarily work so much. But there still is a place for that. If I get something wrong at work, I expect a bollocking, quite right, because it's you know you have to keep on the toes. There's no one doing that. Kieran Trippier is is a leader like that. He's got a voice, so you needed someone like him. You know what? If you look to your if you look at your team now and you say right, whoever's going to come in as coach, if you put Declan Rice in your central midfield, and if you put um, or Jude Bellingham, and if you put Kieran Trippier at right back, that's probably 150 million quid worth of of expenditure, top whack, obviously wages on top of that. You know, it's a, it's not simply about spending, it's about spending it correctly. Mm. And I think you missed a trick in the summer. Now, Solskjaer wanted Trippier. So is there some sort of disconnect between maybe the some people at the club didn't feel that Trippier would sell many shirts, but he's an England international. He's exactly what you needed at, at right back. More competition for uh, for, for Juan Bissaka. And I think it would have just given you that. So look, You've got the money. You can say, as you do, that you know the, the Glazers have put their hands in their pocket. Or, to be fair, the Glazers have put their hands in your pocket and invested uh, in in the playing shed. But look, I'm a big Jaden Sancho fan, and I'm sure he will develop and do well, particularly under Carrick, who's a supporter of his. But you're not short of talent out wide. Mm. So anyway, this is, and also you've, you've got to address certain issues of players at the club. I'm a huge Juan Mata fan as a person. As a you know, as a as a player as well, but what is Juan Mata doing at Manchester mm -hmm. United? You know, I can understand it if the club had said, right, go and work with the under 14s go and be skilled coaches of skills coach of the under 15s as well as playing in you know 10, 12 matches a season, coming off the bench, helping us like that. I just admit maybe he is, and maybe I I'm, I'm not sort of so au fait with what's going on at the academy. But I look at the squad, and I'm going, I'm, I'm thinking, is he still there? You know, I mean, it's. So it's not simply about bringing people in. You've got a you've got a spruce your squad, particularly in in a post COVID climate when finances are finances are to an extent an issue and huge wages. You know, at some point you've got to get them off the books. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah, Henry, it's um, always great chatting to you, even yeah. though it can be a bit depressing. <laughs> not not from your fault, but 
when we look at where Manchester United it are. It all seems so promising yeah. at the start of the season, <laughs> I know. didn't it? Ronaldo when Ronaldo came, came we were thinking, you know, we're going to have a title challenge and now, yeah. you know, Solskjaer's gone, Carrick's in for a few games. We don't know what's happening longer term. You know, it's, it's yeah, it is a little bit frustrating to say yeah. the least. Henry, thanks for coming on the yeah, channel. We you. always appreciate your support um, and we'll hopefully talk to you again when things might look a little bit more stable, perhaps, yeah. at Manchester United. Who knows? Do you know what? Manchester United will always be big and they will always have a strong future because of you guys, because of your support. If I write a Manchester United story, it gets more reaction than any other club. There you go, you see. Thank you very much. More bigger really. reaction. So yes. we've still got that to hold on to, <laughs> if nothing else. For now. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Henry. Speak to you soon. Cheers. It's always good chatting to Henry. Yeah, it? always good. I love good. the fact that, you know, he is probably the most respected, well-respected journalist in, in football. Mm. Yeah. You can see he's got such an enthusiasm and passion for it. Talks a lot of sense, even if that sense is depressing. He likes United fans as well. <laughs> yeah, it does. I like it. Yeah, it's good. And and he always makes me feel slightly optimistic, even though obviously he talks how poor the things have run above. There aren't enough football people going on. They don't have a plan for the new manager. And shambolic. Yet somehow, shambolic was and yet the somehow word I'm going, Michael Carrick's the next. <laughs> Brian <laughs> give him a full, give him the deal, just give, give him, him, yeah, give him a contract uh, at the end but, of the season. But yeah, obviously, we, it's just a we're in that horrible kind of wait and see period, aren't we? Where there's no certainty, we don't know what's coming, we don't know what to expect, but the games are going to hit be here before we know it. So uh, yeah, it's going to be fun, and obviously, thank you to Henry for, for coming on and, and chatting with us. But yeah, make I'm sure worried. you go and check out Henry at, I'm Winter, at the Times, um, his recent article as well, where he talks about what's going on with Solskjaer yeah. and the Glazers as well. It's always good stuff. You know where to find Joe, Joe Smith 93 on your socials. You know mm -hmm. where to find me as well, Jane Motty. Don't forget as well to hit like, share and subscribe. Let's get to 700,000 subscribers by the end of the season. This has been the Tier 1 podcast with Henry Winter. Thanks for watching.